And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, com creator, uh, coming to us straight from the, gr the stray goat, don't, don't ask, don't ask about Billy, we don't talk about that. And the, and the creator of the upcoming game Tribulation of Ash and Ruin. Don't call him crazy, but he is Todd Frazy. <laughs> how you do? How you doing today, man? I'm doing all right, and you can call me crazy if you want. <laughs> we are, we're all mad down here, as the as the Cheshire Cat once once said. Or was that the Mad Hatter? It's it's been a while since since through the Looking Glass. Yeah, that was the Mad Hatter. I, through the, I e through the Looking Glasses is can be better can be better described as the most reliable anti the most reliable anti drug ar um arguments that we read as kids. <laughs> is that what you got out of it? <laughs> yeah, say so I got the same I got the same thing out of re out of Return to Oz because I was dumb enough to I was dumb enough to think it would be like the original Wizard of Oz. Um, Return to Oz is drugs. <laughs> I refuse to believe anybody who was re who was doing set design for that for that movie was sober. Yeah, what decade did that come out? Um, want to say um, want to say either sixties or seventies. Uh huh. Um, and if if it was set if it was seventies, I know somebody was on drugs. <laughs> But it's there's some and even even when it comes to the source material of Wizard of Oz, there's some moments where some somebody was on something. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but they were on something. But I like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense, as it as it is tradition. So I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? First introduction to role-playing games. I had to be 12 or 13, and I'm sure a lot of people have this experience, that uh, Dungeons & Dragons starter box. Saw it at a bookstore, and I had just enough money saved up to get it. And it was for the AD&D. had those, uh, I think it had orange dice in it. Yeah, the Pick crayon, that up. the crayon dice that would yes. that would turn around after a few rolls. That's why nobody uses crayon dice anymore. They are quite ugly, but they worked for us. A friend of mine and I went to my room and tore it open, and were immediately confused by all of the ridiculous rules. <laughs> but we pushed through the starter adventures as fast as we could, mm -hmm. as well as we could. before long. We would take turns. I would have a character, and he would make a dungeon, and then try to get through that, and then we'd take switch roles. And I started to notice that every time he would make a dungeon, it got more and more ridiculous and dangerous way earlier, so that he could kill me quickly and play again. <laughs> there was even a room, the first room I went into in one of his dungeons, I remember this to this day, had two doors that were completely identical. I spent a while in there trying to investigate them, and I picked one to open, and it sucked me into the vacuum of space somehow. <laughs> and that was the end of that adventure. So, mm -hmm. from that point on, I was uh, destined to be the dungeon master forever. I moved out of that room and continued to play up until this day. Yeah. Different games now, more than, more than Dungeons and Dragons, but I kept up through the era, and given so yeah, some people are some people are um, one system lifers, and some people and some people um, jump around. Um, and get, given the given the setup that you have that that you've that you've that you've gotten, would it would it would it be fair to say that you were one of those jump around types, or did and um. Did you largely stick to fantasy, or did you jump around in other genres? I largely stuck to fantasy for the longest time. 
And I did follow Dungeons and Dragons for the longest time because I didn't have major access to other outlets. And it was right around the time that 3.0 was coming out that I really dove in. Uh, I really appreciated what 3.0 did to the rules. Mm -hmm. And then follow 3.5 was great. About the time Pathfinder 2.0 came out, uh, I stopped. I was already off into other things. Mm -hmm. Playing, uh, I can't remember the name. Changeling was pretty memorable for me. The Song of Ice and Fire role-playing game, I enjoyed quite a bit for the time that we played it. Which is pro which is probably why you had you had to challenge me about uh, when I when I decided to take a few shots at George Martin. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to ride or die for that guy, but I appreciate <laughs> his contributions. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just I'm just saying I have a, I have a short list of things that are go things that are going to happen before Winds of Winter comes out, and one of one of them is the one of them is the Vikings winning the Super Bowl. Another, another is um, uh, is is Sim is Simbeta writing another Robotech game. Oh, uh, George Martin possibly dying. That's another one. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's um, that's a bit that's a bit grim. I don't I don't want I don't think we we'll want another Robert Jordan situation on our hands. We don't. We absolutely don't. I shouldn't joke about that. But he's um, he's still active. Hey, he was a writer for Elden Ring. I'm excited to play that. Which um, I I'm excited for two things when it comes to that. One, getting to play the thing, especially since it see it seems that we're fa we're phasing out the t we're phasing out the tank boys. Good. Um, mm. and two and two, it'll be an it'll be another round where I get where I get to drink to the suffering of games journalists everywhere. Yeah. Well, we can only hope. Oh, be oh, believe believe me, this happens every time they end up having to play a FromSoft game. It's going to happen, <laughs> and they're going to get publicly pantsed again. Uh, yeah. So, it's so I so um I am I will probably end up setting a bet setting up a betting pool for who's going to have the hot who's going to have the dumbest hot take. Um, but with the, with that kind of thing in mind, um, something I found kind of amusing when I looked at the cover design for Tribulation is, for some reason, it reminded me of the way Alderac used to do their cover designs for um, a lot of their D, a lot of their D twenty and in and in house material. Um, were you f what was that was that an influence at all, or is that um, coincidence on my part? I'm not familiar with Alderac. Um, up until up until they decided to get out of the RPG business a few years ago, they were responsible for publishing um, Legend of the Five Rings and Seventh Sea, along with along with a along with a bunch of D of D20 material. Um, right. And they tended to have yeah. this whole, the big border and t and title in in a, on a lot of their covers. That was yeah, it's a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I was looking into and hoping to play L five R actually. That sounds like a really fun RPG setting. I haven't got around to it yet though. L five R has been one of my has been one of my favorites. Um I the I do I do have a preference for fourth edition L five R. The um fifth edition by by Fantasy Flight is going is going to be a bit of a harder sell because it's using custom dice. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. I don't have any issue with custom dice personally, but I know some people will, will um, s will swear against it. It's a, oh. it's a very scub um topic. Mm -hmm. Um. Now when it now, what what prompted the inspiration for um for tribulation and what you're planning with it? I'd say the inspiration came. First, back in my 20s when I was running a lot of Dungeons & Dragons games simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, many groups in the same world. We had a lot of fun with that. 
where they would interact. There was a time when people, when the group was getting pretty epic level and the maintenance was ex incredibly taxing for these characters. I hope to God you didn't use the Immortals Handbook. Uh, nope, never used the Immortals Handbook. But what I did use was the Book of Vile Darkness. Oh. And there was a device in the Book of Vile Darkness, a demon door, mm -hmm. that I stuck into a dungeon and my titular heroes of the adventure were walking through this dungeon and this courageous warrior dwarf walks into this demon door which is shaped like a mouth but it's got magical darkness blocking the gap in its mouth so it's just a doorway you can't see through no matter how close you get and he just walks into it and he gets his arm ripped off by the machine based on some random rolls and he gets a demon arm attached to his to the stump that casts magic missile and slowly starts to corrupt his mind and turn him evil mm -hmm. so he uh when he gets spit back out he eventually demands that one of his party mates cut his arm off so it stops influencing him. He survives the affair, and that one-armed dwarf becomes his that player's favorite character for a decade to come. And I'm like, what? And that sparked a thought in my mind that players tend to enjoy unexpected tragedy mm -hmm. and trials that change their characters in a way they would, wouldn't have planned to. And from there, I started. I started running games with a little bit, with fewer and fewer fail safes. So, no more resurrection spells is an easy one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get rid of a lot of the epic level stuff. I tended to cap off the adventures around level thirteen max for the as the stories go because things get too powerful, too handy. So along those lines, I started making a lot of house rules, even my own settings that were less magical because the magic at its higher end when implemented at a society level didn't seem to make a lot of sense to me in that it didn't seem very magical. Mm -hmm. The magic itself seemed mathematical when using it. It's a big list of spells that didn't really reflect what I was seeing in the and reading in the books I liked and seeing in the the series and movies that I enjoyed that was, it lost that kind of mystery. Mm -hmm. And I started gravitating towards things like the Conan stories and stuff. So it's just, as I matured, I started moving more toward the sword and sorcery mentality. And that I think grim darks a taken word, but that kind of gritty and brutal feel. And I wanted to, I kept making house rules to the systems I knew that would, uh, steered in that direction and eventually I just started to build I was like you know what it's, it's probably not a big deal to take to build my own setting and build a rule system go along with it mm -hmm. it was it was a very big deal it was an endeavor that's taken many many years but I just couldn't seem to put it away and it continued to grow people continued to play it and test it and enjoy it and other games I had designed had come and gone, and this one just kept sticking around, like um, like a I don't know what to call it. It was quite, it was a compulsion, more than anything, to continue working on it. I did research, studying the different aspects of game design to sharpen myself up, and started researching a lot of other games to see what they had to offer that I thought was interesting, and mm -hmm. see find what I could which which certainly makes certainly makes sense um now give, given given that given that um one of the fir one of the first questions that that I have is with since you you mentioned doing a whole lot of D&D &D and then and then kind of then kind of veering off but tribulation from what I've seen is using a D is using a D6 die pool um, setup with sixes being exploders. Um, what was the, what was the inspiration and reasoning for going with for going with a pool um, set of dice instead of instead of going with a single roll? The 
it wasn't the foundation of the game's design. It's something that I tried a lot of different things out. Mm -hmm. uh, D6 is... What I did like about D6 is, is that it contrasted something I was seeing a lot with the D20s. And that contrast is that the D20s, uh, say, starting level characters in different D20 systems, there's a 5% difference in skill. And from a like or ten percent difference between a skilled person and a not skilled person mm -hmm. to a accomplish a challenge. It's a very wide range of possibilities. D six has tightened that a bit, but they came with their own com conflicts. So eventually, landing on what I found out was called exploding dice, and that's I enjoy. It kept building in that direction because it added a sense of tension to the challenges, and it also gave opportunities to manipulate challenges during the rolling based on different abilities you might have that a uh, with other systems the d10s and the d20s there was a lot of roll your dice add these modifiers subtract these modifiers done mm -hmm. as your result what well, i enjoyed the feel of the d6s exploding a bit more and that's where it stuck now the other, the other thing that I, the other thing that I find interesting with the, with the setup that you have, is the fact that you're, you're building it, you're building it around, four, you're building the system around four pillars essentially: adventure, combat, intrigue, and respite. Um, was was this four pillar setup something that, something that you had on, had decided on early on, or was it something that? Ended ended up developing with time, and I'd like you to go into what, eat what each one is get what each one is going to be. What's the focus of each one, of each one? Some of it might be self-explanatory, but um, work with me. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll go through that briefly. The intrigue, adventure, respite, and combat are the four pillars of pl uh, of an adventure. Say so they're the four elements of gameplay, and different players will tend to appreciate some over others. And I indeed built the class system around those four pillars. The They were part of the original design of the game. And Intrigue, being its own thing, was inspired by Song by Some Fire RPG, actually. That was one thing I pulled from, from that game. Mm -hmm. I appreciated that they had an element of the game that many of my, well, a few of the players that I've interacted with really appreciate complex, engaging intrigues. Or I shouldn't say complex, but they appreciated intrigues that got to show off their their creative creativity outside of combat. Mm -hmm. So that, that one's pretty self-explanatory. Adventure is... An, I wanted to get a system that was easy to use that also involved a lot of the important things in gameplay, like meaningful decisions and uh, st strategy, uh, these kind of things mm -hmm. that, and, and that would cover the, the time from where you're coming from to where you're going mm -hmm. and keep it interesting because that's always been a bit of a problem for in any games that I've been had the privilege to play. Mm hmm and that I've run. We either it, it'd be a fast forward or it'd be a grueling slowdown, and, and rarely in between. So I was adventure got its own place there, so it could have its own little in its a, own cycle. In a respite, weird, in, I should note ahead. that in a weird way, the what the um, stuff that you're doing with adventure, it's not you're they're not doing the ex, it's not doing the exact same thing as what you're doing, but I'm kind of reminded of the One Ring. The One Ring. Yeah, I, 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 I have not played that one. I assume that's a Lord of the Rings one. That was the that was the most recent um, Lord of the Ri Lord of the Rings RPG. It was it's the only one that was that wasn't using a system already established. Um, Cubicle Seven was handling it for a while, but they lost but they lost the license right in the middle of doing a second edition. It's now being done by um, Free League. As it was well, good, so they fleshed out adventure a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. I'll have to check that one out. It sounds interesting. I've enjoyed 
Middle Earth games when I get a hold of them. Mm-hmm. Do you have a review of that one? I'll check it out. Uh, yeah, I did. I I did a I did a whole series a while back where I re- where I reviewed um where I did a whole month dedicated to Lord of the Rings RPGs. Um, but that leaves respite. Mm-hmm. Respite was inspired by. It might be my style of running a game, but no matter the setting, we in, end up towards the late game, particularly doing some sort of uh, base building mechanic in the game where we, the adventurers will have a town that they're supporting and they'll they'll want to spend time building that up or spend time crafting or uh, there are many elements of the game that aren't often paced given their own space i remember in the f- earlier editions of dungeons and dragons they would say when you level up X amount of time has to pass. A week, two weeks, three weeks. And we'd always uh, brush that off because the story itself would be so propelled a events that it often wouldn't have time to fit in all those things that people were building their characters towards being able to do. Mm-hmm. And the things that people were wanting to do with the around town to enjoy their presence there or in a settlement or in a base or wherever they're at. Mm-hmm. And respite was a way to give that its space and account for time to pass in a natural way in the story. Which, which that, that, that's, that's you, because of that, you've, you've kind of, t- you've kind of touched on a couple of things that aren't, always um explore, explored when it co- when it comes to um RPGs um and that's be- that is da- that is downtime and traveling um i mean it's it's ca- in a, in a lot of fantasy games it's ca- it's kind of tu- it's kind of touched upon with travel times and the like and a lot of a lot of SF games do it do it as well but it's ca- but compared to other aspects it's kind of given lip service um now even even though grimdark is an o- is an overused term um I can definitely see the sword and sorcery vibe that you're going with it and that brings me to in it to um a question I have regarding combat um sword, sword and sorcery is known for having a having a very grit like approach where where uh, life is relatively cheap how do how do you how do you reflect? How do you reflect that within your system? A couple ways. One, to um, from one angle, players' characters are they start out pretty capable in in their domain, and so I would compare them to say like a level three in a D twenty system, mm-hmm. and then reach their potential. Their maximum potential. There is no maximum potential. It does keep going, but they reach, they fulfill their character's idea generally by level, around that level eight mark in D twenty systems. Mm-hmm. That's the lifespan of the character. There, that allows players to allow them to be expendable. There is more horizontal growth than vertical growth. I think your listeners will probably know what that means. Yeah, for your characters, and. In the gritty, in the mud, in the combat, mm-hmm. that's that's handled by the fact that there is no hit points, and any any attack could potentially kill you, and that's handled through the the marksmanship and brutality challenges. Mm-hmm. They will depending on your success, continue to cause more and more havoc. And also have with them, depending on whether or not they're a harrowing or sundering weapon, will cause all kinds of afflictions on you, such as staggering you, concussing you, leaving gaping wounds that... (laughs) 
hopefully the players get to feel viscerally. So combat will be something you want to avoid. These afflictions don't go away easily. And should... There's, it's based on your resolve on how long you'll be able to, as a player, continue in the thicket before just suffering a fatal blow or a blow that'll put you down and leave you with a permanent malady. Mm -hmm. But to balance that a bit, the players will be able to choose the malady they take and it allows them to creatively engage. And they also have boons at their disposal, which are potent psychological effects such as uh, resonance or vigor mm -hmm. that will allow them to, or serenity, this will allow them to have their own tools at their disposal to keep them going. So it, you can ask the players that it's still a balancing act. We're still doing play testing a bit, but we've where we've settled now, things can get pretty gruesome pretty quickly. And it very quickly makes players want to try to choose their violence carefully. There's no slaying hordes of goblins or shooting through stormtroopers like they're nothing in this. There is certainly consequences to be had mm -hmm. if you pull out your blade. Yeah. And speaking of consequences, that brings me to one other thing that I find very I find very interesting when it com when it comes to this consequence um, centric system that you have and that is the fate die. A a one d six roll that that can that can either be surviving at the skin of your teeth, getting screwed over, or dying. Yes. A twenty percent. All of these have all of these having a. Hang on, I need to gra need to grab my calculator so I don't screw up my own math. All all of them having a, each of those potential avenues having a sixteen percent chance. Well, set, well, sixteen point six repeating, but we're n but I don't feel like going full math nerd. I'm not drunk enough for that. Sure. Yes. Now that fate die that you're discussing, mm -hmm. the the critical fate die, and that happens whenever you suffer too much havoc too quickly. So you could always avoid that by not getting hit, <laughs> not doing combat. But yes, once you're in the thick of combat, you're rolling. A lot of it's skill, strategy, and tactics, but at some point you're committing yourself to fate. Mm -hmm. There are other fate die in the system, including if you took, say, a hallucinogenic drug or um, whenever you the effects of a harrowing or sundering weapon are determined by a fate die as well. So that's my, outside of the dice pool system, there is another, you get to use the d6 that's on hand and determine the effects of or different effects that might that you might not have much control over. Uh, all right, and um, when it comes, the other th the other thing that uh, that I all that I'm always curious about with ha with ha with how with how these think with how these things work is. The is the uh, is the way magic is go is going is going to work with this kind of thing because it you look at you look at you look at um the likes of Conan or or um the majority of 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 um Robert E Howard style works and magic is this thing that is seen as ver as very dangerous very ritualized and very and very steeped in the un, un in people playing with forces that they can't possibly understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's beautiful. I love it. And how how do you reflect that? Because you've already mentioned being very critical of the more formulated approaches to magic. That's right. Well, and don't get me wrong. I love playing as wizards and clerics. But, well, I think I made my case there. In, in Tribulation, the system was designed to be historically compatible. So you could play it. It's setting agnostic. You could play it in any setting. Mm -hmm. That and from prehistoric in our history to uh, American Wild West, I think all very, very easily tucked in. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a friend who's wanting to use these rules in a sci-fi setting, and that should be easy enough as well. So 
I had to build it this system from the ground up without magic integrated. And you can see, and that has a lot of design uh, pitfalls to it because it can become dry and not very, not very fun in some cases. It's, it's a difficult balancing act. What I do have for those of us who enjoy playing the wizard class, who gets that big collection of spells and gets to uh, strategic, tactically decide how they use these, there are alchemy. There is alchemy in systems in the game. But when it comes to actual magic, should the Oracle, which is the name of the game master in this mm -hmm. system, should the Oracle decide that they want to have magic in their setting, the magic will remain, it should, is designed to remain mysterious and dangerous mm -hmm. and rare. So much so that it's not integrated into the society itself. Though, that being said, I guess uh, there's no restriction there. Mm -hmm. Do what you want. But the way the magic system works, it, the best example would be through the Arcane Focus. The Arcane Focus is an option that might be available to players during character creation should their Oracle decide that it is a world that would allow that. Mm -hmm. And the Arcane Focus would be a Harry Potter wand or Gandalf staff. It allows you to do anything you want to do. Mm-hmm but you do have to commit a good amount of time to charging it. And that would be during respite. You would commit your respite endeavor to charging up the magic instead of going and crafting things or making money or gaining boons, the kind of things that other people might be doing. And then the thing that you're asked, the thing that you wanted to say, you want a lightning to strike your opponent. There are examples of how this could work, and it becomes a dialogue between you and the Oracle as to what effect you want it to have and how that'll play out in the rules. And so far, it's gone a lot smoother than I anticipated because you know that could make some some conflict at the table. Mm -hmm. But I thought it would... It, I suspected there would be some conflicts, and there may yet, but they seem to resolve pretty well because players have in their hands a chance to be creative. They want to open a wall... Uh, open a hole in the wall and mm -hmm. find their way through, they can expend their charge to do so. But every time they do use the magic, there's a fate die to determine a backlash effect, should mm -hmm. there be any. Yep. Hold on a sec. But magic's there for the... Uh, magic is in the world to break the rules. Mm -hmm. So there aren't hard rules for it. There are examples of common mystical items you might see in uh, different fantasy like Necronomicon or the Holy Grail and what their effects might be like just to give the Oracle a primer and some tools to use. But it's... And that that's how we're, we're handling magic in this system mm -hmm. as it was built ground up to fit worlds that don't have magic and therefore it's not integrated into the, the system. It sits aside and breaks the rules mm -hmm. and it's a lot of fun in my experience. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing I'm guessing you I'm guessing you you've planned to have some to have some kind of a side so, to um to, to let people know that magic doesn't necessarily have to be um throwing fireballs and shooting lightning from your fingertips. Indeed, it's limited by the player's imagination and the the oracle's decree. Mm -hmm. Now. One thing that I found kind of interesting when I looked at character creation is the relationship you have between disciplines and classes. Um, specifically in the fa specifically in the fact that they're that they're kind of reversed from how they from how it typically works. And I was cu I was curious as to as to the as to how you came about um coming up with the, with this particular discipline class um, system. Right. The, the, the discipline class system, it, it was a challenge to, to flesh out, as I'm sure many designers have experienced. And this case, I wanted to avoid mm -hmm. things being specific and crunchy those two things were 
not on the menu for the design for tribulation. So there aren't going to be any classes or any advancement abilities that will just add numbers, for example. Um, and they are designed in such a way as to be broad as opposed to specific so that they will fit in many settings and so that any character you could imagine that would fit into the setting you're playing in can be manifest in these rules very easily. So how you express them will tell you a lot more about them than the, say, the discipline that you choose. But yes, it does start out, you get, there are four disciplines to choose from, alchemy, combat, diplomacy, and survival. And those each branch out into, say, the warrior or the ruffian or the dignitary or the scoundrel, the savage, the wildling, and the adventurer. These all, the classes fill out the more distinct niches. Uh, mm -hmm. Survival is exceptionally good at adventure related things, but can branch into different domains as well. Whereas diplomacy is great at intrigue challenges and respite and can get more specific as they go. You go adherent from diplomacy. What these, let me restart, what these um, disciplines allow you to do is they give you almost a generic starting place mm -hmm. that your character will fit into. Are you somebody who's spent your life training to fight? Are you someone who's spent your life studying the sacred arts of alchemy, healing, that kind of thing? Or are you somebody who's a noble or spent your life trying to be a noble or work within the confines of diplomacy? You would pick the diplomacy. And if you're someone who's spent your time out in the wilds and learning how to be self-sufficient, you would be in the survival tree. And, mm -hmm. and then you get more distinct from there picking a class and ultimately masteries to choose from as well. In conjunction with those choices are distinctions, which are one of my favorite things, feats, mm -hmm. tons of feats. But for to, fortunately, for, fortunately, no feat chains, no feat chains, no requirements. It is, uh, those help advancement. If you want advancement to go on for a very long time mm -hmm. and keep dangling that carrot in front of the players, and there's there's merit to that. Tribulation. I'm taking a different approach with tribulation, and I hope that there's a crowd out there that appreciate it as much as I do. The ability to really imagine the character how you want them to be, and build them that way. All all right. And given given that given um that that particular um setup. One one thing one thing that I'm one thing that I'm curious about is where is where you dr where you draw the line between what would between what would be a um, advantage specific to a, to a discipline and what would be um, more of a more of a distinction. Yeah, so disciplines would be things that you learned how to do by uh, training. Mm -hmm. Distinctions are things that make you special adjacent to that profession that you might have yeah or professions and sometimes they can come from experience sometimes they can come from just natural gifts but that they are separate from skills from your uh things that you trained for and try to make money from typically yeah or, or survive with. um when it comes now when it comes to masteries, do you, when it comes to the masteries that each discipline has, do you consider that the capstone of that particular discipline? More like a grab bag. They that you will probably want to have more than one mastery mm -hmm. if you're focused on a particular discipline. Uh, say if you're getting into alchemy, there are many different schools and crafts within alchemy. All that fun stuff that us wizard players like to look through. Mm -hmm. different domains and things like that there's a system like that built in you'll say you wanted to specialize in poisons mm -hmm. there are a couple masteries having to do with poisons that allow you to manipulate the duration of and the incubation period of the poisons uh, there are so you'd want to probably want to get both of those 
but you might instead decide to focus just on everything that might corrupt, like uh, venoms, poisons, and vapors, and you can't get all six masteries. It'll take you quite a while, so you might be more choosy, mm. or you might be somebody who wants to be uh, an assassin, so you'd pick alchemy and combat, and then you'd get a venoms mastery, mm. and then a lethal tactics in combat and there are many ways to express many different ideas or many different generic tropes to make them your own but they are definitely a grab bag more than a capstone so it's not going to be the last thing you pick yeah with the with the um with the set with um because of the because of the way these particular pillars are set up i'm get i'm guessing that tribulation is a game that favors more theater of the mind style approaches that rather than you rather than using a good a good old-fashioned battle map indeed there are no d durations or distances are not measured in any way they're instead moved into functional chunks like in combat you're either in a fray with someone you're right next to them you're close to them which means pretty much anywhere within the field of in the field of battle or you're far from them enough to where you could shoot them with an arrow, but not run right up to them. And those are the di those are the distances that matter. So those are what we keep track of. So yeah, it, it, you can use a battle map, but you don't have to use a grid. We often do use battle maps online because we're playing digitally, and that can help if they're if things get a little complicated. But I designed it in such a way to be. I like how you put it: theater of the mind mm -hmm. more than uh, because these these tools that we love to play with also pull us out of the scene. In my experience, they can pull us out of the scene, but sometimes they're needed. Now, when it comes to now, um, some one thing that I noticed, even even with this early version of the of the uh, document that you've that you set up, that I very much appreciate, and more, and I think more developers need to do this, is you're putting in hi you've put in hyperlinks. Yeah. Yeah, that's more of a recent innovation. It's, mm -hmm. it. I had to learn how to do it first of all, and then uh, there are over a thousand hyperlinks in the guide so far, and they just they ter serve two purposes. One, they highlight the words that are game specific words and not just uh, contextual words, and then if you click on them, if you have the PDF version, they'll take you right to that word's definition. Or the section that defines that challenge, for example. Yeah. And there will be an index. I know you you have a thing for indexes. There will be an index. <laughs> it's a, um, it is certainly a th it is certain indexes are one part are one part of a bigger thing. I am ve um before before we went live, I had mentioned that um I'm that I u that I used to I used to study um web usability and. Because of that, navigation is something that I ha that I have a giant stick up my ass about. That's it's a big deal, big deal. Because, um, largely because of the fact that I've that at a young age I was traumatized by all the book flipping I had to do when it came to um, some of Palladium's work, and and the fa and the fact that the biggest offender when it comes to doing table of contents is White Wolf. Where their table of contents is barely is barely useful because it because if you're looking for a specific rule that's the table of contents isn't going to help you it just gives you the chapters, which mm -hmm. if I if I need to if I need to figure out say the grappling rules looking at the table of contents is not going to help me. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't recall using the I played White Wolf games mm -hmm. a couple White Wolf games and uh. I suppose other people were running those at the time, so I didn't have to worry about the index too much. But yeah, and gr yeah. granted, granted, white, granted, White Wolf's is is sometimes kind enough to put in to put in an index, so it's not as big of an issue. But it's the principle of the matter. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, people will be able to navigate this. We're still ironing out the best way to put the most common things referenced forward. I really I hope to have a a quick sheet put out for say mm -hmm. some of the fate dice you might be rolling more often 
or the effects of different weapons and armor, mm -hmm. which are distinct in Tribulation in that they actually have a function that separates them outside of uh, dice size. So we don't have dice size for damage. So mm -hmm. the, the benefit of that is I got to dig it, use my historian hat for a while and dig deep into why different gear did what it did and why different people used it throughout history. Like why would someone choose a spear over a sword, over an ax, over a mace and really break that out without making it too complicated. And it's had some good success. The downside is you're going to have to reference mm -hmm. each weapon's going to have th two or three features that you're going to need to know what they do, and you might have to reference them a few times before you get used to that. Yeah. So um, it would be nice to have our cheat sheets available. Yeah, I've um, I've ha I've had a I've had a bit of a habit of of lo of looking to see if looking to see if a developer has cheat sheets, which a good which a growing amount of them do. Or if oh, if worse comes to worse, I'll I'll um I'll build I will build a cheat sheet myself because <laughs> if you want to get something sure. done right, you got to do it yourself sometimes. Um, you got to get yep, you got to get that coveted DM screen. I be um, first production line. <laughs> I I will freely admit that instead instead of instead of using a instead of using a bunch of pre built DM screens. I just got I just got one of the, I just got one of those universal ones where I can just slip I can just slip in whatever pages I need. Oh yeah, there you go. Oh, yep, yeah. that's smart. It is somewhat annoying when some because because this the way I can have that set up is I can just have the um, a PDF of the G, of the important part of the GM screen and and then just then just slot them in. It does yeah. I did have to get a second one for G, for GM screen setups that are more vertical than horizontal. Um, page setups, you know the la the landscape pages. Yeah, which is a bit annoying because that because those ones aren't as tall, which means some which means somebody can think that they're slick and try and lean over to look at my dice. Um, which is why I ha which is why I keep a foam bat which is why I keep a foam bat next to my chair just in case. You know, you know the whole. You know, somebody tries to lean over, then you bonk him and go get, and go, and go go, oh. go 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 back to cheater jail. Yeah, I've heard what you do to your cheaters. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, tread I, lightly in the monastery. I I fig I figure if I, I figure if the punishment is so rancid, so horrible that the mere thought of it is en is enough to make people cringe, though then they won't then they won't do it. Um, okay, capital punishment. That, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there, there's a reason. There's a reason why pirate captains had this had this saying: "The beatings will continue until morale improves." <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm going. I'm going to go that far. And now, and the only the only time I've go that far is if someone actively deserved it. Um, like if they end, if they end up being that guy, don't be that guy. Of course, of course. That, um, he's because he's the per he's the person who who would be dumb who would be dumb enough to br to bring a bag of Cheetos at, at the table, which in any civilized situation is enough to get you a flogging. I hope all my players <laughs> hear this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I'm I'm not messing ar I'm not messing around with it with with any of, with any of that and bes besides I besides I tend to, the snack of choice at my table tends to be grapes. Good choice. Good choice. Um but when it when it comes to the playtesting that you've done so far with Tribulation, what were some of the big takeaways and some of the big lessons that you took that you took from it? That the one that's been the most tedious is has to be complication factor, and the game's improved tremendously through the last two years of playtesting. Just introducing players to the game and say, seeing what confuses them right off the bat, and and finding ways to innovate around. Like, do we really need this complicated system here? Do we need this system over here? Does it has to be have to be this different? 
And what it ended up doing is making a lot more, make, making things a lot more uniform and trimming the rules down quite a bit while keeping all that good juice without losing it. But yeah, it's definitely been the thing is getting rid of the complication mm-hmm. in playtesting. And it's to, but as a creator, it doesn't seem complicated to you because you're surrounded by it. You know, you're, you've yeah. been working on it for a while. So that that's fantastic. Another big thing that, that the feedback has given me is it said players have wanted to make say this character or that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, Oh, there's, there's nothing in the rules to allow for that particular weirdness. Hmm. And then I'll find a way to integrate, uh, clean things up and make sure that everything's accounted for. That was solved pretty early on. I haven't had any players have any issues with getting a character that they imagined to exist on the page. Um, and I, and truth, truth be told, I do, I do think, um, I think it'd, I think it'd be an interesting experiment to see what to see what kind of what 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 kind of crazy ass or dumb builds people can people can uh, come up with cuz um I've I've mentioned plenty of times in the past that I have a certain fondness for dumb builds like say the muscle wizard. <laughs> yes, uh, that's a com- a complaint I would say I had with a couple playtesters who had these interesting ideas in their mind to make a character but this game isn't designed like a lot of games they've played where no matter what character you pick you're pretty much going to be you're going to survive combat Mm -hmm. so they'll make this really fanciful character and then just get eaten alive by wild dogs or uh, find themselves useless in combat because they didn't prepare themselves for that and so that's a problem but it's it's one of those give and takes. Mm. The game is not going to treat you gently if you make a a character that's not cut out for the world you're in. And typically, in my games, I run pretty brutal worlds. So, but the <laughs> but the the system is set up where you don't have to. I guess just there. I've humored running a non combat campaign mm-hmm. to see how that goes. But, uh, I have a few players who would appreciate that. We'll see how that. <laughs> we'll see if I come around to that. Yeah, I could, I could, I could certainly see the, I could certainly see the possibility of it. But um, you could uh, make a muscle wizard in this if you want to. <laughs> but I, I, within the builds, there are a lot of niches to make whatever idea you have functional. Mm-hmm. That's because that's a. I like to make those oddball characters myself because I don't like to tread what's been tread before. Mm-hmm. I'll make a character that is. A snowflake in some way, <laughs> and then, but there are ways to make them work. You just got to look for them. Yeah. Now, with that said, what what do you have? What do you have planned for the for the within the coming weeks? Regard within the coming weeks and months when it comes to how um, tribulation is going to be developing. Right now, we're deep in the beta playtesting phase. So, what I'm looking for now is. Playtesters that are willing to test the game without my oversight, which I've had a couple groups so far do that, and it's been very informative. But it's important to see what other people do with the rules as written in their hands. And throughout that, I'm going to continue to spice it up. I have, I haven't mentioned this yet. There's tribulation is the the setting is the system. Ash and Ruin is the setting. That's the built-in setting that you can ignore if you'd like, but in this setting, it's close to our historical world, but different enough to maintain that sense of mystery that the people of that time would have felt. Yeah. They didn't know what a rhinoceros was. They didn't know what a tiger was. So when you or I might be playing through the world and we encounter a rhinoceros, it's nothing magical to us. So I am adding creatures in there that would be surprising and different and those are coming soon as well is that why you is that why you opened the the book as it is right now with here be dragons here be dragons yeah well i'm a history nerd big time and the interplay between history and psychology my two favorite things you get like carl jung and 
he's and Joseph Campbell uh, uh, read these guys like crazy. You'll see the, the notion of what what is a dragon, for example, and what does that mean to the to the people who thought this up universally. Mm-hmm. This game doesn't have any dragons, actually. <laughs> the Ashen Ruin setting doesn't have any dragons. So I do have rules snuck in there for if you want to include like the classic dragon in your game. There's there's some examples in there, but Ashen Ruin setting has no dragons. Mm-hmm. But dragons are truly everywhere. Mm-hmm. They they are the they are the wilderness embodied, and journeying into the wilderness to confront that is this is the essence of adventure itself. Mm-hmm. And I'll like I said I'll cer- I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing to seeing how this kind of thing de- how this kind of thing develops, um, especially since the world need the world needs more um, sword and sorcery. So I have more of an excuse to break out. Ennio Morricone's um, musical talents in my games. <laughs> that one went over my head, sir. Ennio Morricone is a, is a le- is a legendary um, um, film composer. He did he did a lot of stuff for spaghetti westerns. He did a he did a fair bit of stuff for both for both of the Conan movies. Oh, um, okay. I can hear his music now. He oh, he um, is also responsible for for help for contributing some contributing some tracks to some of um ter- to some of Tarantino's work. Um, yep. In that in partic- in particular, he helped he helped some of his some of his tracks were featured in Inglorious Bastards. I I don't remember if they're tracks that that were already done or if they were or if they were um if they were do- if they were done specifically for the film. But he's he still ha- he still does really good work. That's awesome. Well, my players are going to have to tolerate that next time we play. That'll um, be the background music for us. Usually, I, we're rolling with uh, High Lung, which is amplified history, Celtic, Germanic, uh, tribal stuff. <laughs> I've um, whenever whenever I need to utilize ma- some sort of magic in my setting or some sort of supernatural in my in my setup, um, I often use Philip Glass. Which might cool. sound a bit odd because Philip Glass is more known for a lot of electronic in that in that first generation era when pe- when people started to um, explore the idea of using synthesizers. But the Ooh. reason the reason I would use it is because is because magic is supposed to be weird. Yes. And ha- so having having it be represented by discordant electro- electronic notes. Um, certainly helps. I even, I even lifted a few tracks from the um, Forbidden Planet movie. Mm. You know, okay. where 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 um, using electronics was so verboten that the <laughs> Composers Guild of America w- did not allow did not allow the composer of that film to refer to refer to his soundtrack as music. Uh which sounds just petty enough for someone to actually do. Yeah. Oh, sure. Anything that's cutting edge, there's going to be somebody trying to pull it back. Yeah. Um, Kids these days, am I right? I I often I often remind I often remind I often have to remind people that even the classics were were once modern. Um. Ev- as a, as a bit of an example, La Donna e Mobile was the one of the um, cl- one of the more well known pieces from the opera Rigoletto was very controversial at at, at at the time, largely largely because of depicting a boozing and whoring French king. Um, I love it. There, I, I there's, like controversial stuff. There was the fact that. As much as uh, as much of a required listening as Bohemian Rhapsody is these days, um, early on it did early on it did not go over well, especially because of how long it was. <laughs> That's funny to think. Um, and I um and as as a capstone, I re- I remember coming across an old. A old um, it an old edition of the New York Times that was com- that was complaining about how imp- how the waltz causes improper arousal. Their words. 
<laughs> so that's why whenever whenever somebody does the whole kids these days um, argument, I I just I just laugh because because I'm pretty sure they heard the same argument thir- thirty years ago. That's right. Um, nostalgia is a sweet poison. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness here. Absolutely. It's and been a pleasure. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to discuss sword and sorcery and why Solomon Cain is the be- is Robert E. Howard's best character, or or um or or the or the fact that we'll, or the fact that tribulation will probably be finished before Winds of Winter is, or just or just a shit post. The door is always open. As I All often right. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. And of course, wow. a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their uh, their schedule to come onto the show and listen to uh, listen to our ramblings. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>